Yeah, let me first uh, share my slides. Okay, so hello everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here today to share with you some of the uh, topic we're going to cover regarding the drug discovery and the role of the computers and in cynical design in the drug discovery. So today's section will have two talks. I'm going to give a first talk, mostly on the more general introduction of the drug discovery and in cynical design in the drug discovery. And I think the Professor Sun will give the second talk, uh, give you some examples how the recent AI-driven techniques can help the drug discovery. Uh, so I think, um, so I like the students to uh, have some of the eye contact. So if you are willing to, you feel free to turn on your camera during my talk. Okay, so I'm going to go to the full screen mode. Okay. So we're going to talk about revolutionary design of the drug discovery through the in cynical design. So what does the in cynical design mean? In cynical design, which means using the computers, using the computational method to help the drug discovery. So I'm going to start my talk with a very simple slide of this. So you can see this picture shows many, many drugs and oral drugs. And I think that all of you take the drugs when we get sick in our daily lives. Right. Have you wondered what is inside of these drugs? What are the active components of these drugs? Most of the drugs in our days we take actually are consist of the small chemical compound, right? So here is a list, this picture lists a number of the drugs in the market. All these drugs are cancer drugs. So those drugs are used to treat cancer. These drugs are all made by the small chemical compound. I think most of you have learned the uh, high school chemistry, and then you probably have, are familiar with these chemical structures of this uh, small molecular compound. Right? You can see they have different shapes, different functional groups, but all of these divided by the uh, different kind of pharmaceutical companies that are used to treat the cancer. Now, how does this uh, tiny, teeny chemical compound is able to act to treat the disease, right? What is the action mechanism of the drugs? So the action mechanism underlying the small molecular compound drugs actually are very simple. So this is more like the playing the Legos. I think the, uh, most of you have played the Legos before. Playing the Lego is like matching the shape. In this particular case, the three-dimensional shape of the molecular compound, this is a drug, has a particular shape that is a match, this shape will match into the three-dimensional shape of the protein binding pocket, right? So this drug will bind to the protein by matching the shape. Now we call this docking, docking at the molecular level, and this is a molecular docking. Now the protein, the drug is able to dock into the protein, and this protein is one of the component in the diseased cells, and this will help the treat the disease. So the drugs binding to the protein receptor, protein receptor can treat the disease. And the binding is more or less like matching the shape. Now you can think about this as a key and lock. Now the three dimensional shape of the key has to match with the three dimensional shape of the lock. Now when the match, like the three dimensional shape of the drug will bind into the protein pocket, right? And then this will be able to treat the diseases. Now this, of course, is a three-dimensional structure of the small molecular compound, right? Now this uh, red dot corresponding to the oxygen atom, and this uh, white dot corresponding to the hydrogen atom, and the gray dot corresponding to a carbon. So these are connected to a chemical compound. Okay, so let me give you one example of this uh, key and lock model for the drug discovery. Now there's a drug called Gleevec. This is about uh, uh, early 2000. And this drug has been shown to be 100% successful in the phase one clinical trial to remove the, the cancer blood cells, right? So this to treat the blood cancer, leukemia. So people are very excited about this drug because in the early stage of the clinical trial, there's a 100% successful rate, right? So you can think about uh, 
that even the Time Magazine published a paper with a cover story saying uh, this is a wonder drug of the century and everybody getting so excited. So maybe the cancer can be, tra can be treated using this drug, right? We call this a miracle drug in 2001. What is a drug action mechanism? What is a Gleevec? Gleevec, of course, is the name of the small molecular compound, like many small molecular compounds I'm showing you in one of the previous slides. Now this is a three dimension, this is a chemical structure of this compound, right? You can see it consists of the number of the ring structures and this converted into the three dimensional structure. This is a, like this shape, sort of like the little bit bent in the middle. This three dimensional structure of this chemical compound Clevac will match into the binding pocket of this protein. And this protein is showing in the green color and the yellow and the purple colors. Now this protein is actually one type of the protein we call the tyrosine kinase. You know, like in the human cells, you have all different sort of the proteins that serve as a, a working horses in the cell. And this particular type of the protein, this uh, tyrosine kinase or ABO kinase, its function is to control the cell division. Basically, it will send the signal to the cells at the time the cell needs to divide. Right? However, in the cancer cells, in the cancer patient, what happens is uh, this protein becomes uh, malfunctioned, right? It has a bad function. It basically keeps sending a signal to the cell saying, divide, divide, divide. Then the cells keep dividing and eventually grow into the tumor, right? So how do we inhibit the malfunction of this uh, able kinase? So that is the role of this drug. Gleevec is able to perfectly match to the binding pocket of this protein and inhibit its bad functions. Okay, so this is a, a drug action mechanism underlying its uh, treatment for the leukemia. Now, people are getting very excited at that time. Now, people would think, right, the cancer can be treated, the cancer can be cured, right? We know this year, 2021, we know cancer is still a big problem, right? There's no miracle drug for the cancer. So what happened? Now, 13 years after, in 2013, there's another article in the Newsweek. This article basically saying the Gleevec fails. What happens is uh, after a number of the years, the tumor or the cancer relapse in a large number of the patient, right? So the tumors grow back again, what happens? Now, what causes this uh, drug resistance? We call this a drug resistance mutant, right? So you may not be very familiar with the biology, but you probably heard of this uh, mutation. Now, what happens here is uh, in the original drug target, we call the wild type drug target. This protein has a particular three-dimensional pocket that fits well with uh, Gleevec, right? Think about the key and the lock model. So what happens is what, after the patient was treated with the Gleevec, after a number of the years, the patients start to develop the drug resistance mutation. So what really means is uh, one particular amino acid, you know that protein is a polymer, it's made by the amino acid. One part of this uh, protein, so one single amino acid has a mutation. It changed from the blue color shape to the red color shape, right? Even by your eye, you can tell the red color shape is larger than the blue colored shape. And this red color thing is able to overlap with the drug Gleevec, right? So this will block the binding of the drug. Then the drug is no longer effective. This we call the drug resistance mutant. Now going from here to here only requires a single amino acid mutation. This is a threading to isoleucine. Now, basically, if you go back to our example of the key at the lock, you would think about what happens is uh, the key does not fit into the lock anymore because the lock has changed the shape a little bit. Right. How do we deal with that? Now, the drug resistance has imposed a major challenge for the drug discovery, I think, especially for the cancer drugs. Now, what happens here is I'm going to use this slide to explain to you a little bit more about the, the treatment process for the cancer patient. Right. So what happens here, so if the patient is first diagnosed with cancer, I, then you have the, the patient has a tumor, then you go to see the doctor, then doctor will first probably the uh, 
prescribed, prescribed the radiotherapy, and then in the meanwhile, treat the patient with the first nine cancer drugs, like the Gleevec I just introduced. Right? This first nine cancer drug is able to help shrink the size of the tumor, and here the y-axis corresponding to the size of the tumor, and the x-axis corresponding to the, uh, the time. Now you can see the red color tumor is according, uh, is according to the, is based on the wild type proteins, and this tumor can be shrunk after the treatment of the first nine drug, right? This is the first nine drug with the help of the radiotherapy. Now, however, after two to three years, what happens, you have another tumor grow up, and this tumor is due to the drug resistance mutation, like what I talked about in the previous slide. And then this tumor will grow again, grow back, due to the drug resistance mutation, right? And if you go to, if the patient goes to see the doctor again, if you, if the, if you are lucky, if the patient is lucky, there is a second nine drug. Second nine drug, and think about, that's a different key that match into the lock with the mutative shape, right? And then if you are lucky, you will be, uh, the patient will be treated with the second nine drug and the blue colored tumor will be shrink again. Now, after another two to three years, unfortunately, a new drug re resistance mutation will appear and the tumor will grow back, right? Then tumor size will increase quite a bit. Now, if at this time, if the patient is unlucky, there's no specific uh, targeted medicine for this uh, drug mutation, there's no such key that will fit into the another mutative lock, then there's no hope. Then the cancer will keep growing and the patients will die. So this is actually the, how, what happens with the uh, treatment with respect to the drug resistance mutations, right? Now, I guess some of you may wonder, what if, what if the, I have, so here I have two to three years, right? For the, for the cancer to grow back due to the drug resistance mutation. What if I, during this uh, time interval, right, two to three years is a long time, maybe I can develop a new key, a new drug to treat this particular mutation, right? Because the mutation of the patient can always be figured out by the sequencing, right? So maybe you should think during this uh, two to three years, I can develop a new drug and that is able to treat the drug resistance mutation, right? After, after another two to three years, for the green colored, uh, showing here this tumor, I can develop a new drug, right? So if that's the case, the patient can keep living by taking uh, first nine, second nine, third nine, and fourth nine uh, cancer targeted medicine, right? So uh, that's just a, a, a very wishful thinking. So in reality, what happens here is to develop a new drug takes time and costs a lot of money, right? So it normally takes about 10 years to develop a new drug because you have to go through a number of the stages all the way from the early stage of drug discovery to the preclinical studies, to the clinical trials, and to the approval of the, of the FDA. So this whole process takes about 10 years and costs a lot of money. Now, there's no way a patient can uh, wait for 10 years for the development of new uh, targeted drug that is able to target the specific mutations. Now, in our days, I think that in the market, most of the uh, cancer targeted medicines are first nine drug or the second nine drug, right? I think that's really third nine drugs. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you there are two challenges we're talking about related to the drug discovery. The first one is a drug resistance mutations or drug, drug resistance mutant. Now the second one is a drug development time and cost. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money. So our resolution, our, our solution, so I think in this talk from now on, I'm going to introduce how can we use the computers to help address these two challenges, to help address the drug resistance mutation and to help address the drug development time and cost. Right? So what we do is we try to use computers to capture the motion of the protein motion, the movies of the protein motion. Okay, now what's the difference between a protein and a lock? The lock is rigid. The key is a solid, right? It's not moving, right? However, protein is a flexible polymer. In chemistry, we would like, we would like to call it a polymer, right? So it's basically, it's flexible. And in reality, protein is not rigid. 
protein is in constant motion in the room temperature. Right? So this we call the thermal fluctuations. Right? If you, here is a structure of the protein. You can see this protein has a specific three-dimensional shape as we talk about. And some part of the protein can serve as a drug target, right? There's a binding pocket for the drug. Now, this is a one static picture of the protein with a well-defined three-dimensional shape, right? So in reality, protein is moving like this. It's constant motion in the room temperature due to the thermal fluctuations. And this movie of the frames, right? Each one of these frames during this movie may serve as a new protein structure to help us uncover the new drug targets, right? So I think the putting the motion of the protein into the consideration of the drug discovery by the in silico design, I think is a very promising approach to help the drug discovery. Now here's one example. This pharmaceutical company called Relay Therapeutics. And this pharmaceutical company is aims to discover the new drugs or fighting for the drug resistance mutations by considering the motion of the protein into their drug discovery pipeline. Right? So I think the, uh, this, uh, this Relay Therapeutics is a, is a quite new company and it's quite successful. Now, let me just go deep, a little bit uh, deeper, dive a little bit deeper uh, to tell you something about the technology uh, behind or underlying of this uh, modeling, the motion of the proteins. Now, every one of you have learned this, I hope. Uh, I think uh, it's very simple physics, high school physics. So the, the simulation of the protein motion, as I'm showing in the previous movie, and as I'm going to talk about in the remaining part of my talk, is actually based on the very simple law of the physics, right? This is a Newton's equation of motion, where the force equals uh, mass times acceleration, right? So the difficult part here is a uh, protein itself consists of the thousands of tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of atoms, right? If you consider considering the surrounding solvent, the entire system go up to millions of atoms. You can think about, we have to simulate the millions of atoms or millions of bores moving simultaneously in a box. And some of these are connected by covalent chemical bond. And this, is a really a computational intensive problems. And because of this uh, fundamental time scale of the system, now, for example, we have to model the chemical bond vibration, and that is a very fast. That occurs at 10 to the minus 15 seconds, right? We call the femtoseconds. So the time step for this simulation has to be very small. So the whole technique is there. However, the simulation itself are very time consuming. In 2013, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given to three scientists to actually imply these opportunities of doing the simulation of the protein motion and its implication for the drug discovery. Right? So these three scientists are Martin Kaplas, Michael Levitt, and Avril Washel. In the citation of this Nobel Prize in Chemistry, it actually raised this Nobel Prize was given to three scientists for their contributions of the modeling and the simulations or multi-scale modeling of protein uh, motion. And this actually opened up therapeutic opportunities which the static protein structure cannot offer. As I talk about, if you consider a movie of the protein motion, and then you give you uh, plenty of the additional opportunities to uncover the drug targets. Okay, computers. Now, I think the, I don't know how many of you have watched this movie called the Hidden Figures. I think this movie has been a few years ago. It's a quite nice movie talking about the, uh, a group of the African uh, American scientists, uh, the female African, African American scientists to help the LASA to design the, to compute the trajectory of the launching of satellite. Now, in that movie, it actually talk about these uh, computers. This is an IBM punch card machine. So this is the first generation of the computers after the World War II, this in 1960s, right? So in this uh, punch card machine, you actually have each one card, you, you punch the codes in the card, and each one card is corresponding to one line of the computer code in the nowadays, right? So you have the box of card that will give you one simple one page programs, right? Like if you want to program in nowadays uh, uh, computers. Now, this is actually the first computers go back to 1960s, now, in that, 
in that time, using this type of the punch car machine, people started thinking about doing the computer simulation of the proteins. And this is, a, uh, this is the first simulation of the proteins back to 1970s. And this is a simulator protein consists of the 1,000 atoms and the simulating 10 to the fifth steps, right? So this is a movie I show you in one of the previous slides. What can we do in our days, right? So the, you cannot imagine how much the computing power has been improved since 1960s, right? So I think this year in 2020, uh, in 2021, the world's fastest computer is this one, uh, Fugaku computer, uh, that is actually named after Mount Fuji. It was located in Kobe, Japan. So this supercomputer is consists of the 159,000 computer nodes, right? So this is a picture of their server room. You can see it consists of large number of the computer nodes and all below the floor or on the roof, you have a knot of the cable connecting all these nodes. So their internal connecting speed is also very fast. So this is the hardware side. In the software side, people are also keep developing the simulation methodologies and the new tools and the methods can help enable the ultra-long molecular dynamic simulation for the large proteins. And my group is actually working in this area and we are mostly working on this uh, simulation methodology called the Markov state modeling. So I'm not going to uh, talk about the detail, details of this, but I just want to show you a movie which is uh, produced by my group. And this is actually, uh, it's kind of funny. You can see the protein moves so much in the solution. This is a very large protein, consists of the uh, nearly 500 atoms. And this protein is called RNA polymerase and it's rose to transcribe the DNA to the messenger RNA. So it's uh, this step we call the gene transcription. And you can say uh, in this system, we simulate 10 to the 12 steps, right? So uh, in, this, in this regard, we really have uh, simulations of very non-simulations or very large protein systems. Okay, now what can we do uh, with this uh, motion of the simulation of the motion of the proteins, right? So here I want to introduce a couple of examples uh, in the next uh, a few slides. Now the first one I want to introduce is actually uh, this scientist whose name is uh, David E. Shaw or D. E. Shaw. D. E. Shaw is actually a founder of the uh, hedge fund company in the Wall Street. And I think it's number six hedge fund in, nine, uh, in 2017. And in his spare time, he actually invested a lot of money into the uh, designing a special purpose machine just for the simulation of the protein motion. Because David E. Shaw, I think his expertise, he's a computer scientist. His expertise is a high performance computing. And he actually designed this Antoine supercomputer, right? So why we call this a special purpose computers? What happens here is when they design this computer all the way down to the GPUs or CPUs, they're not using the general purpose CPU. They're actually using a special purpose uh, a central processing unit, right? So this one is called Antoine uh, CPUs. So this CPU is uh, optimized for the simulation of the protein motion. And the one of this Antoine machine is like this, right? So it's showing, it's uh, located in the, in the headquarter of his company in the 42nd Street Times Square in New York City. Now, this one of these machines costs about a million to two million US dollars. And this machine is a specific for the simulation of the protein motion. Okay, what can we do with that? Here's an example from the Antoine machines, uh, Antoine supercomputer simulations, where it actually shows the second line drug. Remember when we talk about Gleevec example, Gleevec is the first line cancer drug, right? So the drug resist resistance mutant will develop after a number of years. And then people also develop a second line cancer drugs treating the drug resistant mutant of the Gleevec. And this is called a disatinib. And this drug is actually binding to a slightly different binding site of the Gleevec. So this simulation shows how this drug is moving on the protein surface in the considering the motion of the proteins and eventually find its correct binding site. So this is a disatinib is a second line cancer drug to treat the drug resistance mutant of the Gleevec. Right, so this is one example. Another example I'm going to show you is uh, HIV. Now, I think the, uh, in the 80s or 90s in the United States, HIV is still a big problem, right? 
So in that, in that times, there's a lot of companies working to develop the drugs for the HIV. And one of the popular drug targets for the HIV is called HIV-1 integrase. So what is this? This is basically a name of the protein in the HIV virus. And the function of this protein is to help integrate the viral genome into the host genome so that the virus can hijack the, the, many, the, the human cells to replicate itself. Now, this protein is a very critical to the function of the virus. So if you can block the function of this protein, you're going to kill the HIV virus. Right? So there has been the drugs has been developed in the market, especially from this uh, company called the Merck in the United States. And this drug is able to uh, target this particular binding site. Here I'm showing in the green color. So this drug, this is a drug called 5CIDEP. This is one of the marketed drugs targeting the HIV integrase. This drug is binding to one of the binding pockets shown here in the green color, right? Okay, interesting, during the simulation of the protein motion, Professor Andy McCarman's group at UC San Diego, they actually discovered a very interesting thing. During the dynamics of this uh, protein motion, they found there's another binding pocket opened up right next to the original one, right? And this binding pocket can also accommodate this identical drug compound. So basically, two drug molecules can fit into the same one single protein target to two different binding sites. And these two binding sites are connected, right? So you can think about, you have the two keys fit for one lock, right? Two keys, one lock, fitting into the one lock. Oh, so this is very interesting. And I think at that time, the Professor Andy McCarman, I talked to him later, and he told me at that time he's thinking, since two identical drug molecules can bind into the same protein target, what if we use chemistry to connect them together, right? Can we make a larger drug compound that is able to accommodate or that is able to occupy both of the binding sites? So if this uh, newly discovered binding site is true, right? Because this only open up during the protein motion. Okay, so he's, uh, he succeeded in this. I think the, what they did is uh, they actually come up with a new drugs that is able to connect these two uh, original drug molecules into a larger one. And this is a, uh, they call this a butterfly compound. You can think about the shape is like a butterfly and these two side is corresponding to wings of the butterfly. In the middle, you have something to connect them together. Now, this new drug in the red color shown here is a much stronger, uh, much stronger uh, effectivity uh, is much more effective compared to, the, compared to the original drug, right? So link the two drugs together, form the much better drug, right? So, and this drug, of course, as I mentioned, is in the butterfly shape. Okay, very luckily, this company, Merck, is very excited about this. They actually pushed for the fast approval by, by the FDA, and the, the drug was discovered in 2004, and the and it was approved by FDA fast track in 2007. It only takes about three years, right? Think about it. normally a drug discovery takes about 10 years, but this one is very fast. Now, this is another example of considering the protein motion that will help you to really discover, uncover the new drug target, uh, drug target pocket, and that will help you for the drug discovery. Okay, now let's move on to the next challenge. How about the time? Right? How about time and specificity? Now, can we use this uh, uh, in clinical design to help uh, save, save the time of the drug discovery? So here I want to use, uh, uh, I want to use an example, another example for this drug discovery. So this example is to treat the autoimmune disease, right? So this autoimmune disease will give you the skin rash and hair loss, and this is related to one of the uh, malfunction of one of the protein kinases, TYR2 kinase, right? And this drug targeting this uh, particular kinase is called uh, tofacitinib, and this drug has a very strong side effect. The reason this drug has a very strong side effect, and this side effect will lead to the anemia and the weakening of the immune system. The reason of the side effect is really go down to the point there exist multiple proteins in the human cells that has very similar shape for the binding pocket, very similar shape, right? If you think about, go back to our example of the key and the lock model, the key has to 
match the lock, right? Then what if you have the multiple locks in your human cells has an identical or very similar shape? Then there's no hope. You have the key to block one of them, this same key will also block others, right? So this is what's happening for this uh, side effect of this drug. Now we want to block TYR2. However, because TYR2 has a very similar structures with the three other proteins, so it will simultaneously block JAK1, JAK2, JAK3. If you block this, these three proteins, you will lead to the side effect, right? Can we, can we design a new drug that just binds to the TYR2, but not bind to the JAK1, 2, 3? And this we call the drug selectivity, right? Can we design that? Now, first of all, I want to tell you, I'm not joking. Indeed, this uh, four target I'm talking about has very similar binding pocket. And you can tell here is that we overlay the four protein structures, JAK123 and the TYR2, together with the drug compound, right? So all this surrounding this is the proteins, and in the middle, that is a drug compound in the green color. Right. Of course, as I said, this is a, a chemical structure because proteins are polymers, and this is what we call the stick model, a uh, bow and a stick model of the proteins, where the red color is oxygen, uh, the blue color is a nitrogen. Say so you have the amide group and all these functional groups. And you can see all these uh, four proteins has a very similar shape, right? Very similar shape. By even by the naked human eyes, there's no way you can tell the difference. And of course, this drug you design that will inhibit one protein will also inhibit the three other proteins, which you don't want to inhibit, right? So how can we design a new drug that selectively binds TYR2, but not the JAK123? Now this is actually, we call the new dimension of the drug discovery. So simply by key and lock model, by matching the shape is not sufficient. In this case, we have to engineering or design the drugs corresponding to the tightness of the binding. What do I mean by the tightness of the binding? In the, in the chemistry of physics, we call this a free energy, right? I, I believe the, most of you have probably uh, uh, learned this term free energy. Free energy is a really a characterization of the tightness of the binding. And the free energy is related not only with the enthalpy, but also with entropy, right? What is entropy? Entropy is a characterization of the disorderness of the system, and that is naturally related to the protein motion and flexibility. The more flexible the protein is, the higher the entropy is, right? So this company called Schrodinger that was founded by a professor, Richard Friesner from Columbia University, and his company is actually the focus on developing this calculation of the free energies or try to accurately estimate the tightness of binding based on the simulation of the protein motion, right? And very uh, exciting, I think this company is the first company that has been IPO'd just a few months ago, uh, focused on the in silico design of the drug discovery based on the physical principles, right? So this is a very successful example. And using this, uh, their company's uh, finish calculation method based on the simulations, they can actually uh, team up with uh, uh, Nimbus uh, Therapeutics Company, they can actually accelerate the drug discovery process because now you try to screen a lot of the compound in the silico, right? And this will be better than just doing the docking because docking just gives you the, mat the, the matching of the shape. And these free energy calculations will give, give you the consideration of the flexibility or the entropy of the system. So this will help you the accelerate the test, narrowing down of the compound for test by threefold and they can actually, this uh, new inhibitor that identify indeed has a 500 times the selectivity. In other words, this compound binds to the TYR2 500 times uh, stronger than the uh, binding to the three other uh, targets, right? This is very exciting because by looking at the shape, there's no way you can tell the difference. And this whole process takes about uh, the 10 months to go from the uh, beginning to the identify of the lead compounds, right? So identify of the lead compounds and the preclinical studies is only the first step of the drug discovery. You still have to do the clinical trials, right? But at least this process has been uh, uh, reduced down to the only 10 months, right? So that's already been uh, uh, quite acceleration. Okay, so I hope I have convinced you and I have explained to you how the putting the protein motion at the heart of the drug discovery 
will open up the new opportunities or possibilities for the drug discovery of many diseases. And in this, in this regard, I think the in clinical design using the computers can help you quite a bit. Okay. So before I end off my talk, I'm going to just include a couple of slides, sort of have an introduction and set the stage for Professor Sun's uh, talk right after me, right? Now in recent days, I think in recent years, uh, artificial intelligence uh, becomes very hot. And that also has been uh, widely applied for the drug discovery. And people believe the AI-driven drug discovery is also the future, right? Using the computers, using the artificial intelligence, uh, based the algorithm, you can help the accelerate of the drug discovery. So I'll leave the, this part to Professor, Professor Sun to talk about more details, but I just want to show you one example here. So this is a very exciting uh, recent work from, the, uh, from this uh, pharmaceutical company from China, Wuxi Tech, uh, in collaboration with a few other groups. They, are, they actually develop a deep learning platform that is able to find the lead inhibitor compound of one of the kinases within 50 days. You say go from day one to day 46, they already find the lead compound that has been validated by cell-based assays, right? So this is uh, all the way, uh, go from 10 months, right, talk about, and down to the 50 days uh, below two months. So things are getting very excited. So I think I'm going to end off my talk here and I'm happy to take questions. And uh, I think the professor soon after me will introduce more about AI-driven drug discovery. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Sun, the stage is yours. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, so shall I start now? Yeah, sure, please. Um, right, and um, so my pleasure to join this um, uh, symposium. Uh, it's probably the first time we talk to high school students and teachers. Uh, so I will uh, introduce them what we uh, learned about this um, AI and deep learning in this um, drug discovery. <coughs> And first of all, probably I'll give you some background. Uh, what is a drug? And so I'm sure all of us know uh, the drug is a chemical compound, uh, which and when applied to a living system and produces the biological effects. Uh, the drug could be a, a solid, could be a liquid, or even a gas. Okay? And drug usually bind to a protein and modify the biological functions of the protein. So as I showed you, one and protein, I use the, the uh, surface and, and to, to show the protein, and then I use the stick model to show the small molecule, which is the drug bind to a specific side of the protein. And this is again another presentation to show only the backbone of the protein. And I use the two different colors to demonstrate this protein is a homodimer. And in this case, the, you can see certain, we call the beta sheet, and this is the alpha helix. So in the interface of this homodimer, I use this space feeding model to represent how does this antiviral drug bind to the viral protein or enzyme, in this case, the the HIV, for example. And if you look at the a literature and majority of the drug targets are proteins or enzymes. And if we analyze a little bit further, you could see the proteins could be membrane proteins, account about 40%, as Professor Huang mentioned, and certain of the, the anti-cancer drug uh, targets these membrane proteins, for example, this and g coupled proteins, membrane-associated proteins, ion channels, receptors, and soluble proteins or transporters, and so on. So these are the roughly distribution of those um, protein targets for those um, drugs. And, and of course, we know a protein are the, uh, one of the most abundant organic molecules in the living system. And proteins actually that consist of more than one or more than one long chains of amino acids. So I'm sure 
uh, in the high school, you've learned this an amino acids already. So it's typical molecule with one amino group and also one acid group. And this amino acids can assemble through condensation of the carboxyl group and also the next an amino group to form this we call the amide bond and then the assemble to a biomolecule or the polymer. So every protein is made up of a sequence of amino acids bonded together. And then this protein will form this um, typical structures. We call the secondary structures, either like a helix, okay, for example, um, or beta sheet. And this um, typical secondary structure, the first assembly to form this um, three-dimensional structures. So as I showed you here, you probably even can guess the molecule was this um, protein, okay? So we have the typical alpha helix, we have the sheet, we have the random structures and disordered and so on. And so this is um, one of the example of this um, COVID-19 main protein. Okay? You probably heard from the news and this is the protein, it's an important drug target for the treatment of COVID-19. And so if I use this um, typical presentation of the protein structure, you will see this is the helix and, and the beta sheet and random and so on. And then I use a different representative um, to show the overall protein. And because uh, in, in the up, we didn't show the hydrogen and so on. And so in the bottom, we show everything. And then the stick model to represent the drug binds to the uh, main proteins. Okay. And I'm sure we, we heard about it and how to really uh, kill the virus infection. And protein normally, and if you look at uh, in human bodies, and especially after the uh, human uh, sequencing, and so, so we, we know we have about an, an over 20,000 different protein targets. So each protein performs a specific function in our body. And importantly, protein can interact with each other physically. So in this case, then the protein-protein interactions play the crucial role in cellular functions and biological processing, all of the organisms. So I show you as an example to demonstrate how complicated of these protein-protein interactions. And of course, reflect the difficulties for the drug development. And accordingly, and how many small molecules? Okay. So we currently have around 170 million registered chemical compounds, as you can check from the in American Society's website. Okay, so these are the maybe the rich source of um, potential drug candidates or starting compounds and for drug discovery. And of course, you can use them as devices. But we have the problems. Okay? So around 170 million chemical compounds we have about 20,000 protein targets. So find the best chemical compounds to bind to the right protein is really the very tedious and very difficult job. We need large search space, but we find the needle in the hail stack as I showed you here. So the drug discovery is really extremely hard and takes much longer time. So this is the slides I showed you how difficult for drug discovery. So drug discovery and development normally takes about around 10 years process from the ideas to the market drug. Okay. You need to find the proper target and then we can screen. And after that, how do we optimize? So either chemical modification and rational drug design. And subsequently we need to do a variety of animal studies to see, for example, the pharmacokinetics, bioavailability, toxicology, and so on, before we go to further development. So in this case, we need to go to the, the different stages of um, clinical trials from phase one to phase two, phase three, and so on. And subsequently, we have to register and be you know, approved by a reference authority. And so each step takes, you can see, from two to three years, to five to six years, and eventually you can imagine it takes about around 10 years. Okay? So that's one of the problems for drug development. 
even for the vaccine this year, and last year you can and see, and, and when we face this pandemic, it takes a huge amount of resources. And of course, even that, and so the development of the vaccine, and eventually, I hope uh, we can use it very soon. Still, we, we bear, bear in mind, uh, we are not sure the potential side effects in long term. And therefore, so deep learning and AI uh, will speed up the drug design and drug development. And so in AI, the models can be used to process the big data available in drug discovery products. The models have been developed to learn from available data. And equally important is predict the drug compound structures and properties. Okay. So this is the diagram to show the AI in healthcare finding heat in the a, a historic high in the second quarter of the uh, second quarter in 2018. And uh, you can see the equity fund and, and equity deals and so on to, to increase them dramatically. Okay. So Professor Huang mentioned to you already on the basic concept of this um, AI. Okay. So you can see from here we have the deep learning. And so deep learning, in fact, makes the computer then learn to get smarter. And the artificial intelligence, AI, in fact, makes the computer smarter. Okay. So the AI provides a way to build intelligent programs, machines that act like a human. While the machine learning is a subset of AI, provide models to automatically learn them without being explicitly programmed. And the machine learning models component, for example, we, we need to set up this data set and the features that of course we, so before we data set up data set, we, we need to have the uh, theoretical basis and how can we really set up this data set. Okay, so that's the, uh, the typical uh, machine and learning model. And there are a variety of different data sets and you can easily find from the internet. Okay. And for example, the protein data bank, Okay, and this bank only stored the protein information. In other words, the coordinate of the protein scientists and published. And this is a requirement for any publication of the protein and drug interaction or protein structures. You need to deposit into the protein data bank. Okay. So this bank won't save any money. Okay. And then we have another data bank. This is called PubChem. And so more than 100 million records of the small molecules and so on. And so we have other biochemical bioassays, in this case, the 2 million biochemical assays. And so we have another data bank we call Zinc 15. It consists of more than 200 million compounds. And this um, binding DB and more than 1 million binding data. So these are the rich sources for deep learning and AI, where you can use certain of the data uh, in decent amount of uh, data banks, and then you can uh, use it as a starting. Okay. For data representation, and so in other words, the feature extraction, so machine learning the requires a vector for the graph representation of the molecule and the protein. So you have to simplify to make the molecule as the graph, as I showed here. And then simplify to the molecule as the input line for entry system. So we need to build, in, to build up a spanning, spanning tree and write search order, as I showed here. And then each molecule or each element as a node and the chemical bond as an edge. So the chemical group can also be a node and also the chemical bond and, and, and as an edge. So in this case, we can see we can and make this a molecule to generate this three-dimensional matrix from special structures of the compound for protein, as I showed here. So the molecule, I can simply make as a three-dimensional matrix. So using this matrix, and of course, then it will be easier for the computer. We can train the computer. And so here I give you 
the flowchart, for example, application of the AI in drug development. So we need to identify the drug target and then screen the small molecule data bank. And if possible, even we can use the virtual screening to predict what are those potential compounds and clinical development. And so how can we predict the disease associated proteins? And what are those proteins could be a potential drug targets? So before we can do a little bit further. And so I use this um, no, recent work as, as an example to predict the disease associated protein targets. So we use this um, convolutional neural network to predict disease associated mutations of protein targets. And we all know the protein will evolve and mutate during the evolution with millions of years and, and with time. And certain amino acids can be changed to a different amino acids. So in this case, in this we call the mutation. And this mutation, uh, in most of the cases, um, could be okay and won't generate any side effects. But sometimes uh, some mutations will disrupt the function of the proteins. And therefore, in this case, we need to analyze comprehensively to see what are those proteins and with mutations may cause potential diseases and so on. And so we use this um, variety of data bank, as I showed you already. So the data integration, we, we integrate and, and not only the protein data bank, and we also use those clinical data and cancer resources and so on. And then we build up this, we call the conver convolutional network and neutral network model. And this model, and then we can evaluate the model to make sure the model is good and useful. And more and more in the group, and so he built up this model. So we use this, for example, over 23,000 structures uh, from the protein data bank. And then we also get this um, and over 100,000 uh, mutations of proteins. And we also get these um, mutations from the cancer sources and a variety of other mutations. So based on this data bank and input, and then we get over 1,000 proteins with disease-associated mutations. And also with 261 proteins with these mutations, then based on that, we can train the machine. So we generate this three-dimensional matrix first, for example, this is the affinity grid map. And then we calculate interaction energy. So based on that, of course, then we, we divide it Okay, we use some five types of probes, um, aliphatic carbon, aromatic carbon, and so certain interactions, for example, electrostatic potential energies and so on, and then we can calculate. So this is the a sequential information of a particular binding site. For example, we use the zinc because the zinc is very important for all of us okay. from this um, DNA application and to certain critical enzyme functions in human body. So we use the zinc binding side of variety of proteins as example to show how can we predict the potential disease associated mutations. And our feature groups, for example, we know the MDSC composition and we do the auto correlation and it goes the sequence order and C2 MDSC compositions and so on. All of this consists of these descriptors. So we have every size of the about over a thousand, and eventually, uh, so this is the flow chart to represent the, the, the input of data, and then the generation of three-dimensional matrix. So these are the uh, typical probes we use, and, and we train the machine, and then eventually we can get the data. So based on that, of course, we also compare with the different kinds of um, models. So this is the zinc binding size. So this some blue curve to represent and what we used to see how reliable of those and presentations. Eventually we found certain mutations are really very important and for potential cause of diseases. And based on that, we train the machine and in future. So whatever mutations and, and for a chaos volunteer or, or, the, or the patients, and we can predict potential diseases. So therefore provide very early 
diagnosis approach for potential diseases. Okay. So this is one of the example. And of course, then and second, we would like to see to predict the drug role or drug ability of a protein target. How do we know this protein could be a drug target? And before we do this screening and clinical development and so on. And suppose we discover a disease associated protein target. So if this is the protein druggable, so we use this, for example, main protein as an example again. And I use this in representation to show the overall shape of the protein in solution. And to predict the droppability of a protein target, we need to define the surface fingerprint based on this uh, geodesic distance. So this is the protein surface. And the different color to represent, for example, this grid or metallic white to represent this hydrophobic or neutral. And this um, blue color to represent positively charged. And the red color represents a negatively charged group. And therefore, you can see on the protein surface, so some parts are negatively charged and some parts are positively charged, and some parts are neutral or hydrophobic. Okay, so in this case, then we get this interaction fingerprint. It's a hydrophobic, as I showed you already. This is a typical hydrophobic. And this then red color, because of the negative charge, they can have the potential electron donor of the bucket. And the blue represents a positive charge, the region, and so on. And therefore, we can get this an interaction fingerprint. And eventually, we get this um, systematic um, extraction of patches. So which we use this to, to represent. And of course, we need, need to use a variety of um, data from the data bank, such as a data bank, and a variety of others, even docking, data bank, and so on. We collect the protein structures, interface, and non-interface points. So in total, for example, you can have over 3,000 protein structures. With 90%, you can train, and 10%, you can test. And for, for technical details and probably and, and we can talk about it later. So the polar grid of the five features have been produced for each protein ligand structure. And we extract the five features and from each other, for example, from shape, from the distant, distant curves, so hydropath. So this is the chemical features and electrostatics, free electrons and protons and so on. So we can get it to extract these five features from each other. And then we can build a geometric and deep learning model to define the polar grid patch and move it to the, on the surface of the protein. Okay. So as I showed you the flow chart here, so this is the uh, convolutional uh, layers and we have the fingerprint descriptors. And then this is the application specific layers. And in this case, of course, that showed you the results and we, we have the uh, certain, uh, for example, the mass site, uh, SPPIDER, and so we have the uh, typical details on the protein molecular surface using this uh, geometric and deep learning approach. And so we will know what are those potential drug targets of protein, and then we can predict the potential binding of a small molecule with the small molecular data bank, or we can even use the virtual screening. So in this case, then uh, we use this uh, uh, novel antibiotic compound prediction as example to show that if we use that we know the protein target already, and then we can train the set with over 10,000 molecules. So again, we, for example, direct a message passing using this uh, direct message passing neural network. So we can again split this molecule as the grid. And after that, we have this model validation to make sure this is a model. So based on that, we have the chemical space. So we just further screening using this deep learning approach and then we can generate new antibiotics to simply use the deep learning AI approach. 
before we do any wet experiments, really speed up the drug discovery process as, as one mentioned. So this is the power of the, the computer or the deep learning. And then uh, we can perform experiments and on over 2,300 compounds to evaluate the effects on the E. coli growth, for example, because we try to identify the new antibiotics that the E. coli is, uh, is a bacteria, and then we can use that as an example to see how effective of those compounds. So we, we're training on the growth inhibition against the E. coli, and, and then we use the, again, different color to represent the relative growth of the bacteria. So the higher the number, that means the growth of the bacteria, the red represents a certain compound can inhibit the growth of the bacteria. In other words, it could be the potential antibiotics. And then you can, we can use the, the graph representative of the compounds. And so the, the message passing neural network has been used to extract the futures, as I mentioned previously. And we, we train the model. So in this case, um, we can train the model using this over 2,300 compounds in the training set. And so we know certain of the compounds are uh, inactive and certain of the uh, functional groups are active. And then we can uh, input the data, train the computer. So I use this to represent uh, the complexity of the data, but nonetheless, uh, and the approach can be used to uh, identify or discover of this um, potential new antibiotics. And of course, then for, uh, for machine learning or AI, we need a test model. Uh, so we can predict the antibiotic effects of more than 100 million compounds. Okay. So certain of them uh, are known than antibiotics. So in this case, you can use this as input to train the machine to make sure uh, what are those compounds are active, what are those are inactive, and then the machine will learn and, and later can be used. Okay, so this is the result to represent and after treatment, uh, sorry, the, the experiment shows the two compounds can be used as novel antibiotic agents for not only E. coli, for Staphylococcus, for other pathogens and so on. And so you can see the time at zero, in other words, before the addition of the compounds and the red curve to represent and after four hours the incubation of the compounds in the E. coli or the bacteria. So indeed, you see one of the compounds are very active, can inhibit the growth. And for your information, the CFU is the count of number of bacteria in the culture media, for example, the clay or the, uh, or the flask. And so, of course, the, the lower the number, the less the bacteria, in other words. So the red curve on the right side clearly demonstrates this is a very effective antibiotics to kill the virus, uh, sorry, the bacteria. And therefore you can see the bacteria. And so we use the log unit, so 10 to the power of nine, and this is 10 to the power of two, okay? Uh, because the variations are huge, and therefore we use this log unit. And so we observe indeed this is the compound can effectively kill the a, the E. coli to suppress E. coli growth. And once we get these small molecules, and, and of course we can first optimize the chemist and, and biologist can first optimize and through this and again the different approaches to further uh, find and enhance the activity. And, and even we can optimize these clinical trials. Okay using this an AI, because in clinical trials, again, it's very tedious. Only 10% of drug candidates entered the clinical trials. So ending up becoming regularly approved drugs. So as I showed you previously, we have the phase one, phase two, phase three, even phase four, because it's certain of a compound, even are being approved, uh, used in clinical trials, and you still have to monitor, we call, we call them post, marketing studies. And uh, you probably heard from the media sometimes one compound was drug used in clinical for one or two years has to withdraw from the market because of the unexpected side effects. So in 
and of course then the AI and can speed up the clinical trial process because most of the past is a clinical trial is really very cost very high and the part of the reason because of patient recruitment so the AI can help to reduce the cost because in this and clinical trials and the patient recruitment outsourcing cost and site recruitment site retention and patient retention and data management validation so on it's a very complicated process so how can we really make it efficient and speed up the clinical trials so ai again can help and using this um, neural uh, language processing for patient recruitment and for example in us and the, for one of the clinical trial matching with the clinical trial center they use this approach and so this is the a, again, data bank is called the clinical trial data bank in U.S. and by the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, the organization. You can find all of the information and of the drug entered into clinical trials. It's a phase one, phase two, the phase three, and of course you can find all of the medical literatures. So you can extract the features to build up this what we call the NLP model, and this model will be useful for clinical trials. And for this um, an IBM Western Health is a Western for clinical trial matching. Uh, so in cooperation, of course, with those uh, clinicians, and they can use this um, uh, AI uh, to result in 80% of the increase in enrollment uh, in this uh, systematic and therapy uh, clinical trials, for example, for breast cancer seen 11 months after information. So you can, for example, visit over 2,000 by these breast cancer patients and then input this model. You can select the appropriate, a suitable subject in the short time. You can see it within 24 minutes. Really, uh, previously it probably takes you several months. Now you can just simply use 24 minutes. You can achieve that. And then we can connect the patient to the clinical trial studies so how can really connect them together. So there are a large number of patients who likes to join clinical trial studies, but finding a suitable clinical trial is very time consuming. So you need to find a clinical trial, enrollment, and here adherence the, the monitoring as I showed you in this diagram. And so this is again very time consuming. So using the AI, you can speed up the progress dramatically. And of course, to make this drug available, uh, much shorter time comparing the previous uh, approaches. And this is the RANCOM data system. So these are the important system or important class of machine learning that offer the relevant suggestions to the users. So based on this, for example, clinical trial center data, uh, you can select appropriate patients. So this patient clinic trial interaction matrix. So we build up this matrix to train the machine that so we call the machine learning model. And then we can predict the related clinical trials for, for new user. And the patient clinical trials matching platform. So this is the a startup company a, that used the machine learning to connect patient to trial, to clinical trials. And so you just simply input certain information. And so what patient meet research, for example, sponsors, patients, and so on, you can input information, and then they can quickly provide you the certain information. And all of the, this is the AI application in, in drug development. So from the target identification, small molecule screening, and clinical development, and I think uh, and I, I shall uh, stop here to give you a very general introduction about the use of AI in drug development. And I think the subsequently and, and the, the rest of the time, uh, we'll be happy to answer all of your, your questions. And so before that, I shall thank all of the people in the group, in particular, uh, uh, Mohamed, who initiated the AI 
on drug development in this group. And so I'm sure the AI will revolutionize not only drug discovery and a variety of um, areas, including even chemistry. So nowadays, even AI can uh, provide an extremely useful information and on chemical synthesis and really speed up the chemical synthesis for drug development process. For that, I think I should thank all of you for your attention. Okay, we found, okay, uh, there is a question from, from the participant. May I ask Chen Siofeng to speak? Oh, so can you hear me? Yes, sure. Please ask the question. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sun, I would like to ask, uh, because the protein, they, uh, they are uh, uh, dynamically moving. So how to ensure those protein can get into the sites? Uh, so that they can uh, perform their uh, medicinal uh, effects and how to fix the co confirmation, I would like to ask. Do you mean the protein or the small molecule or the drug candidate? Um, um, actually, the, those drugs, how, how can they get to the correct sites and then uh, they can perform their medical effects? Okay, so this is a, a, a very good question. For all of the drugs, we take either orally or through this um, uh, intravenous injection. And so not all of the drugs will go to the site of action, for example, the plantain proteins and so on. So we call the side effects because then, and they will be wasted, they will be digested and before they reach the target. So this is one of the reasons and we need to use this, we call the target, uh, or even we need to use this um, a drug delivery system to use, for example, the cargo to bring the drug to the site of action or the protein, and then release it to let the, let the drug intact with the protein and then to stop whatever biological function. So you are right. And there are a variety of approaches. So either you conjugate the drug or drug candidate with, for example, a specific peptide or antibody, or even wrapped with a certain biomolecules to reduce the side effects of compound to increase the, the percentage of the drug uh, approach the target side, for example, the protein and so on. So this is the approach for, uh, for medicinal chemistry and even for pharmacy, pharmacies and pharmacology. So pharmacologists then also try to use different kinds of formulation again to increase the efficacy of the drug. It's a very good question. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is Evan Kwok. Uh, could you unmute yourself and ask a question? Oh, yes, please. Um, Professor Hong, I would like to ask um, whether um, capsaicin nodes, um, the chemical compound found in uh, capsaicin node, uh, the chemical compound found in uh, spice and also uh, bacterial phage um, occurring uh, in uh, natural sources. Are they the new um, weapons in our hands of fi uh, fighting armory? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think so. what you mentioned, rose compounds from the natural sources, right? We call the natural compound that come from the plant, come from the fish, right? Come from the, all the marine biology species. This uh, natural compound provide uh, profound sources for the drug candidate. I think a lot of the drugs in our days are actually arise from this natural compound. So you're right. So rose natural compounds are very useful. But um, sorry to uh, just uh, deliver a quick follow up. But why sure. uh, this, uh, as this uh, cancer are keep mutating, why um, capsaicinos are just um, so effective that um, no mutation it really stops it? You mean, the, uh, could you repeat your question? So no mutation stops this uh, compound? Yes. Um, just like capsaicinos are always effective. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Oh, that, yeah. So, okay. 
so this is a, uh, so what, so let me just sort of the rephrase your question to say that if I understand your question correctly first, right? So you are talking about uh, this uh, natural compound. It also has a receptor in the human body, right? So for example, this uh, spice compound that has a spice receptors, maybe in your tongue. So that will be bound to the spice receptor. And then that will perform its function and people will feel the spicy. Uh, so why this does not cause a uh, drug resistance mutation, right? So this is not a drug. First of all, what you talk about is a natural, uh, uh, natural ligand of this receptor. So nature designs this, this uh, compound to bind into this receptor in order to perform the function, right? So that's how you can feel the spice, the, the sensation of the spice. So the drug we develop are not natural compound. They are inhibitors trying to inhibit the function of the natural function of the proteins, right? These are often will induce a drug resistance mutation. However, for the natural compound, it's a, it's a, the protein performs natural function, right? So it will be less prone to develop the mutation. Does that, does this uh, uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, because this is a normal function versus the inhibition of the bad functions. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I, I think they need some time to, to think about the questions. Uh, may I ask a question first? Uh, yes, uh, I saw that there, there is a term called the druggability. Uh, would there be any virus that, that cannot be, I mean, there are no binding site or no, no sites that can be drugged. Would, would there be any virus like that? <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll start the answer and then I'll let the professor soon uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, yeah, to amend the answer. So my mm -hmm. understanding is that drug ability are related to many issues, right? Mm -hmm. So in the, in the past, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the membrane proteins are very difficult uh, to be uh, used for the drug target. It's because there's a little known about the structure of the membrane proteins. In the past, it's difficult to get the information up there. So there's no way you can, you can design drug based on that because you don't know the shape. It's very difficult to design the drug. You can do the blind, uh, sort of blind screening, but that's difficult, right? So uh, this is a, a drug community, but in, but in general, I think all the proteins could serve as a protein drug target uh, as long as it has a specific shape, right? There are some proteins that don't have the specific shape, which we call the intrinsic disorder peptide, like the, like the diabetes 2 and all these kind of disease are, are somewhat related to the aggregation of the intrinsically disordered peptide. For rose target, it will be more difficult, I think. Uh, just my opinion. I'll pass the uh, uh, mic to person in case uh, you want to add something. No, I, I think um, I just like add a little bit and more because um, uh, as I showed you the protein, protein interaction network, the map, uh, it's, it's really complicated. Uh, quite often, we always find certain proteins are in the not, in other words, than several important pathways. So if the protein the, in the uh, junction of the important in protein uh, interaction networks, and those some proteins are probably the better drug targets because you can disrupt a certain um, signal pathways. Uh, and of course, then any protein could be a potential drug targets, but again, uh, you can use maybe the AI deep learning to predict them. And, and, but again, drug discovery is complicated and quite often we use certain empirical relation, previous published data. And even we train the machine that still takes time. And uh, yes, and certain proteins, and the more we learn and the more we know and, and the more we, we can find they may be the potential inhibitors or drug candidate from one particular protein target or protein. Okay, thank you. Uh, here is a question from a student. Uh, Chen King Tai, would you like to ask your question? Uh, may I ask uh, for some recommended articles to read about the topic, um, both of the presentations, please, thanks.
Oh yeah, sure. We can probably send and several references and uh, in, in our presentation and both Professor Wang and I, we include certain key references and in the bottom of the slides. And of course we can give you more general information and, or references for the topic. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put together a list of the reference. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So uh, if the students are interested in doing these kind of things in the future, so what, what should they do now in a secondary school? What should they study or, or learn more about? Could you give them some advice or suggestions? Well, so this is uh, uh, this direction, mm -hmm. I think is at the interface of the computer science, math and uh, chemistry, biology. So it's quite interdisciplinary. Uh, so for those of students who are interested in pursuing this direction, I would think maybe the, you need a sufficient chemistry knowledge and biology as well as uh, mathematics. Right? I don't think you have computer science uh, uh, topic in the high school. I don't know the situation, but HKDSE, you have chemistry, biology, and, uh, and math. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons and when we admit the students and from high school, we always request you have appropriate training on chemistry and biology and mathematics. And of course, in addition to others. And so these are the, the really fundamental of um, uh, research in future. And so work hard on chemistry and on biology and and also mathematics. So this, these three subjects are really important for, for your future development, for your future career. Okay, here's a question from Artis. Artis, would you like to ask, ask the question? If I want the slides for reference, uh, do I uh, leave my email to you guys or? Yeah, we, we will send. Yes, we will send it to you. Okay. And how about, how about, do you have any questions about the topics that uh, talked about today? No. Okay. I... And I think I noticed one question from Susanna. Sent me a question to ask, can drug candidate pass through the heart brain area? for cutting brain cancer. And this is a very good question. And because then uh, it doesn't go to the difficulties for drug development, for, for example, aging or tumor and so on. And so you need to design certain company, make sure pass through the where in fact this is the defense of the human. So we won't allow those and compounds and let it pass through the, go to the brain, okay? And there are different kinds of approaches you can use them, even you can use the protein as a carrier to help the compound pass through the blood brain barrier. Yeah, that's a good question. So normally for those and compounds or drive the treatment of an aging problems in neuro, for example, brain tumors along, you need to make sure the compound has to pass through the blood brain barrier. But of course, there are a lot of technical details if you have the interest. And I'm sure Professor Wang and I will be to answer you in more details. Yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. Why is it often more difficult to develop the, the, the drugs that is uh, considering the, the blood bring the, the barriers? Okay, it seems that. Uh... This, is there any more questions? If no, then we may end the, end the sharing today. And thanks, Professor Huang, Professor Sun, and Professor Mohammed for their, for their sharing today. Uh, please be reminded to fill in the questionnaire in the chat room. And if you have questions, please let us know. Thank you. And participants, you may leave now. Okay, thank you, bye.